Let us pray. God of grace, may the words of my mouth and med- the meditations of the hearts of your people, both near and across the mile, may they be pleasing unto your sight this day. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In Barbara Kingsolver's novel, Animal Dreams, Hallie and Cody are two sisters who are just starting out life on their own. It's the 1980s, and in a streak of independence, Hallie decides to leave home for Nicaragua during the Contra War. Once she moves away, she pins a letter to her sister back home explaining why she left. She said, Cody, I've decided that the very least you can do in life is to figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is live inside that hope. I've thought of Hallie's encouragement to her sister often over the last few days. Friends, I want to acknowledge the space that we occupy today. I want to acknowledge what we know and feel and live to be true. And that is that it has been a difficult week to live inside of hope for the future of our country. How can we live in hope when the highest court in the land, empowered to administer justice for all people, is more interested in, to quote Justice Jackson, breaking new and dangerous ground? The Supreme Court ruling that the president has total immunity for official acts as president is one of the many recent rulings that threaten our democracy. I wonder if the court has read the words the proverb offers us today. Partiality in judging is not good. An even more literal translation of the Hebrew would actually say, recognizing a face while judging or administering justice is not good. In other words, the proverb advises that everyone be treated equally under the judicial process. Now, Bible scholars aren't quite sure when this proverb was written, but it seems that it came at a time when so-called evildoers seemed to flourish. Yet, in the midst of injustice, the proverb holds out hope, boldly declaring in verse 20 of this same chapter, the evil have no future for the lamp of the wicked will go out. The wisdom of the Proverbs is based upon an understanding that hope and optimism are not one and the same. I fully admit And I think many of us would recognize that the circumstances of our country right now can make it difficult to be optimistic about the future. But optimism is circumstantial. We can stir up optimism through our own ingenuity. In other words, if the Reds are up 12 nothing going into the ninth inning, there's reason for optimism. 
But any long-suffering Reds fan will tell you that optimism can disappear as quickly as it rises. God does not have to be present or even at work for one to be optimistic. But hope defiantly exists in spaces where darkness and despair tend to linger. After all, the story of our faith was born off the back of an unlikely alley in Bethlehem when John said the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Eugene Peterson in the message translation takes that a step further and says that God moved into the neighborhood. Church, I came to remind us this morning that uh, despite a court that treats the president one way and everybody else another way, God is still in the neighborhood. You see, the wisdom of Proverbs is not based on something as fickle as optimism. The wisdom of Proverbs is based upon a different understanding of how the world is ordered. The wisdom of Proverbs recognizes that hope in the midst of injustice is that light shining through the darkness. Hope can rise in our hearts and set our sights on a new dawn because of the ever-abiding presence of a God who has moved into the neighborhood, who has moved into our lives and is actively at work bringing justice to our world. The wisdom of Proverbs flows through the ongoing work of establishing justice and equity for everyone, everywhere, in all of God's creation. Proverbs speaks words of wisdom into our lives. And it is important to note that wisdom is never established from individual flourishing, apart from the rest of society. There is a misguided notion in our individualized culture, and this notion apparently existed to some degree in the text in Proverbs, and the notion is this, that I can thrive as a human being without you. That's simply not true. As Karl Barth once wrote, the wise know how to make use of the whole universe, which is in harmony with and preserved by God. The wisdom of Proverbs is never about personal flourishing against and above everyone else. But the words of the wise in Proverbs encourage the flourishing of everyone, everywhere. That is what we hope for. That is what we join with the Spirit of God in bringing about. That is why we minister. That is why we sing. That is why we pray. That is why we do missions. Because God's mission is already redeeming the entire world. And we have been invited to hope that out of this long night of despair, the dawn of justice will rise. How can we join God in bringing about justice in our world when the odds seem so unfairly stacked against us. There are ways in our everyday lives where we can help bring about God's kingdom and establish justice in our world. My friend Dan Terry had a habit of doing that back home. As we served families at the funeral home that Dan owned, I watched him treat families that could have bought and purchased the funeral home 30 times over the exact same way as families who didn't have two quarters to rub together. One Fourth of July weekend a few years ago, I was working 
and a distressed family came inside to our funeral home. A young man who was 19 years old, the same age as me at the time, had drowned at a lake in Tennessee. The family had nothing. They had literally walked to our funeral home from several miles away, and they had been told by five other funeral homes that their family could not be served because they did not have the money to pay for funeral services. The mother of the young man who had passed away looked at Dan with tears in her eyes and said, You are my one last hope. Dan turned around, looked at me, and said, Grab the keys. We're making a trip to Tennessee. At a funeral service for that family, the bill probably would have come out to $10,000 or more. Dan would not let them offer anything for payment for our services rendered. When he passed away, I thought it was interesting that at his visitation, there was a, a mini gathering of, I think, what the kingdom of God will look like. You had in the same room influential people in our community who had everything and more. And you had in that same room many more who had nothing at all. All gathered together because they realized that Dan treated both of them with dignity, respect, and compassion. He didn't just treat folks that way out of a vacuum. Dan had been so transformed by the life and example of Jesus Christ that he sought to practice that radical transformation in the life of others. We may be somebody's last hope over the coming week. And I know that sometimes it can feel like the odds are stacked against us. I know it can feel like the wisdom of this proverb will never ring true in our lifetime. But the truth is that God has not abandoned us to this new and dangerous ground. God comes near to us and desires justice for all people. And God wants to use us in the holy and hard work of harboring hope in the midst of injustice. There's an iconic scene from The Fellowship of the Ring, Tolkien's classic, where Frodo says something that I think is one of the most brilliant lines in all of literature. I wish it need not have happened in my time. Gandalf says to him, So do I, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time given to us. What will we do with this unusual time that has been given to us? Will we give way to despair? Or will we hold out hope in the face of injustice? For the sake of our country, for the sake of our faith, we will hold to the good and we will hold out hope. Amen.